All right, well, good evening to everybody, and thank you all again for, for being here this evening. Uh, the weather slightly better than last Thursday evening. Um, th- I, I have to say publicly, uh, I don't know where Jen is sitting right now. Where is Jen? Oh, she's right here. L- last, last week, Jen volunteered to pick up the food, the lasagna from Winder, and so she was in the midst of that storm driving a long way there and back, and then she gets the message that it's canceled on her drive back. So can we just thank Jen for her work there? <clears throat> Jen is hating this right now. Um, so I, I want to pray for us, and then uh, we will uh, get to hear from Scott. Uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we would ask that this next hour or so would be uh, beneficial to us, that we would be uh, able to listen and to absorb and to learn uh, and to uh, grieve and to learn about your goodness, even in the most uh, difficult and unexpected and painful moments of life, I do pray that right now you would be glorified and that you would encourage us in our faith and that you would be um, honored in this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And just so you know, after this is over, we plan to sing one song together in here. And then we may have about 10 minutes or so, and around our tables, we may just talk about some of the highlights or things that impacted us the most uh, before we dismiss at 7.30. Well, Scott, we're going to go ahead and jump in here. So um, I guess a way to start would be, uh, can, can you kind of start by giving us some of the takeaways that you might want us to have as we walk away tonight? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so several takeaways that uh, I want to give at the outset that I hope that uh, you, if you remember these four things... I think the night will be profitable. Even if you just remember one of these four, I think it'll be profitable. But before I give you the four uh, big takeaways, thank you for coming. As Mark already said, really uh, grateful that you guys would come to hear this interview. I'd also say uh, not everything will be probably really easy to talk about. So be patient with me. Uh, try to get through, through some of these questions, uh, especially with uh, our son, Michael. It may be hard to, to answer that question. So just be patient. Also, I would say uh, our church is about to celebrate seven years uh, at the end of this month. And with each passing year, I feel more and more gratitude for our church. Uh, I feel like when, you, when I think about our church, Thanksgiving is one of the things that comes to mind, certainly. But certainly the last several months feel tremendous gratitude for our church. I think of Paul when he wrote to the Philippian church, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And that's the way I feel about our church. Really, really grateful for our church. And I'd also say about the format, Mark has given me permission to give long answers. So that's kind of how it's going to go. I'm going to give long answers, uh, especially here at, at the beginning. So some big takeaways, four big takeaways, I think, for tonight. Number one would be, I hope that we all will leave inspired by uh, Liliana's faith uh, and her godliness, her love of the Bible, and uh, just her faith. I feel like God took her faith to an extreme degree, just a powerful, powerful degree. By the end, I hope we will uh, come away uh, really inspired. Uh, she fought the fight. She finished the race. Uh, I hope we will be inspired by her. I mean, she had incredible contentment and peace uh, when it got worse and worse and worse. So I hope we'll be inspired by her faith and godliness. Number two, this is a big one the, uh, that will bang on this drum, is the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God in the face of suffering. Uh, the absolute trustworthiness of God. I hope that we will come away from tonight being assured of the absolute trustworthiness of God, uh, even in suffering. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said it like this. Notice all these words, all. He said, God is always good in all circumstances, in all ways, at all times, no matter what may happen to me or to anybody else. So God is always good, all circumstances, always, all times, no matter what happens to me or to anybody else. God is good and does good in life's joys and pains. And we must not, we cannot waver on this point, on the absolute trustworthiness of God, or or, or we're undone in in the midst of trial. But if we hold on to this, we're going to be sustained in the face of suffering. Number three, the third big takeaway would be the absolute preciousness of this book, the Bible. I hope we will be reminded of the preciousness of the Bible. It's something we talk about a lot at our church. Uh, what the greatest treasure that we have is the Word of God, but certainly in the face of suffering, the Bible uh, is unusually sweet when we're going through suffering. But let me, let me just tell a story here to try, try to, to emphasize the, the preciousness of the Bible. Martin Lloyd-Jones was married to his wife, Bethan Lloyd-Jones, for many years, and they went. Uh, his first pastorate was in Wales, Sandfields, Aber Avon, Wales, a poor area in Wales, and he was there for 12 years, and she wrote a little book about their time in Wales, I think Memories from Sandfields, and she tells about all these conversions that happened in these 12 years. He basically saw many revival break out, and he has these incredible conversions. One of them 
uh, was a man named Mark McCann. Not Mark McCann Drew, but Mark McCann. Uh, this guy's a little bit different than, th- than this guy next to me. This guy had a violent temper. Uh, he was probably about 70 years old by the time he showed up at Lloyd Jones's church, but just a, a violent temper, all kinds of fights in his past. Uh, there was a story told of him that he was getting ready. He was washing up before dinner. His, his meal was ready. His dog ate his meal, and he, he killed his dog. I mean, violent, I won't even go into the gruesome details. Killed his dog, flew into this violent rage. This is the kind of temper this man had. He shows up at lloyd Jones's church first Sunday. He was, the, uh, Bethan said he was arrested by the Spirit of God, and he made a profession of faith the second Sunday at, at their church, and he ended up being genuinely converted. He joins the church, becomes a member of the church. Several months later, uh, Bethan Lloyd-Jones was leaving the, the service, and she heard some guys talking to this guy, Mark McCann, and she found out that Mark McCann could not read, and she couldn't believe that he couldn't read. He was illiterate, and so she said, I can teach you. Mark, I can teach you how to read. Uh, why don't we set up a time where you can come to my house, and I'll teach you, and he was so excited about the opportunity to learn to read, so they set up a time. He came to her house, and she had all these children's books to try to help teach him uh, how to read, and they went through these for, I don't know, several hours, and at some point, he was getting frustrated, and he said, I don't want to learn to read these books. I want to read the Bible, he said. So she said she felt rebuked. She moved these books out of the way. She pulled out the Bible. She opened up to the Gospel of John, and she began to read. You know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and they start going through the Gospel of John. And this is what she writes. The method with Mark McCann was memory and the sound of the words, perhaps some familiarity with some of the sentences, but I love this, but above and beyond all, a sense of the preciousness of the words and an overpowering desire to read them. He wants to read the Bible. He, he knows this, this is a precious book. He has this overwhelming desire to read it. He begins to learn to read the Gospel of John, and she said his joy knew no bounds. He, he loved the, the Word of God, the preciousness of the Bible. But when we go through suffering, it's been said that some of the Psalms, I think you, you and I, Mark, talked about this during the trial, some of the Psalms can, you, you, can, you kinda, can't really relate to them, maybe when you read them. It's sort of like seeing a picture of the Grand Canyon, but then you go through suffering. It's like seeing the Grand Canyon in, in, in person. Mark and I saw the Grand Canyon several years ago on a road trip, and remember it was sunset, and we went racing through the woods, and we came out. It took my breath away. We saw it in per- I had seen lots of pictures, but you see it in person. It is unbelievable. And the same thing with the Bible. Uh, in suffering, some of the time, these promises just radiate out off the page and, and grip you in tremendous ways. Let me just give you a few of them. Hebrews 13, 5. Here's one promise in the Word of God. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. Here's the promise. For he has said, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. One promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But when someone you love is, is dying, and, and they cannot speak, this promise holds sway. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He will stay with you till the end. And he did. That's one promise. Psalm 23. I read it so many times, sir, but I'm just going to read Psalm 23. What a wonderful chapter. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, again, this promise, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows and more promises. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. He began this work, he's going to carry it to the end, or the last two verses, John 10, Jesus speaking in John 10, verses 28 and 29. I give them eternal life, eternal life, the promise of eternal life when facing death. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. God the Father holds us. Jesus holds us. We are double-gripped, one pastor said, by God the Father and God the Son. Eternal life. I mean, there's a wonderful nature of these promises. So the application right here, giving the application already at the beginning, would be let's get to know the promises. Let's soak in the promises. And when we face suffering, how sweet the promises will be when we walk through suffering. Takeaway number four would be the wonder of the gospel. The wonder of the gospel I mean, when we are facing death or when someone we love is facing death who is a Christian, I mean, how wonderful the righteousness of, of Jesus. It's incredible. So here's another story on, on this. I, I watched a, a bunch of the interviews uh, really before the trial hit from retired ministers from the UK. They were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. It was called Before They Leave the Stage. And they, they talk about their conversion story, their call to ministry, and sort of just ministry life. And there were lots of wonderful conversions in, in this in these interviews. But there was one that stood out to me. It was a guy who didn't have any Christian background at all. He didn't know the gospel at all. He, he, he got married and he had uh, three daughters. 
And he had two jobs. He was in a band uh, at night on the side. He was a journalist, day job, making all kinds of money. But in the band, he, he started to drink because there was bars around, and he, he would drink himself to drunkenness, so he was an alcoholic. And he would drive and just get all kinds of trouble. He said his marriage was dangling by a thread, and he, I mean, he could have killed himself many times, but God providentially placed a Christian person beside him in this journalist job. And this Christian uh, individual began to share with him uh, things about Christianity, and he gave him these things to edit. Uh, and it was basically Christian cartoons that had different things in it. And he said that he didn't realize it, but these things were starting to take root in him. There was one about judgment and hell, and he, these things were starting to roll around in his mind. Well, he had the low point of his life. He, he went out, and he got drunk, and he wrecked his car, and uh, he was threatened with going to jail, and they're going to take his license away. This is the very low point of his life. He went back to work Monday. And he's just feeling, you know, very low. And he, he began to talk to this Christian friend of his uh, and just ask him, do you really believe this? Do you really believe the gospel message? And he began to just get these answers, get to hear the gospel message. And he got up from this conversation. He said he went to this little bitty bathroom. He knelt in this little bathroom, turned from sin, trusted in Christ. He said he was too embarrassed to say anything to this guy. But he said he got into his car to drive home. And this, this, this is what moved me. He said, he said, I knew that if I died tonight, I would go to heaven. I mean, just the wonder He's lived, all, he's wasted his entire life, and in one moment he's covered in the righteousness of Jesus, and that's the beauty and the power and the wonder of the gospel. I mean, I, in, when she was in the hospital, I would think about the righteousness of Jesus, and I wept. I said this at the memorial service. I wept multiple times because of the, uh, of the wonder. I wept for joy because she was covered in the righteousness of Jesus. No condemnation uh, for her. So again, application would be let's soak in the gospel. Let's sing about the gospel. Let's remind others of the gospel, and let's tell the gospel to non-Christians, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. That's very helpful. So <clears throat> can you kind of give us kind of the big picture starting back, I guess maybe even in July-ish? Uh, when did this trial start to begin for Liliana? When did y'all start to notice it? And then maybe you could even talk about uh, the, the first day in the hospital. Yeah, really you go back probably June is when she started feeling bad uh, in June and she, she had pressure in her head and she went uh, to the doctor and they prescribed her antibiotic and didn't really get better from the antibiotic really got worse. And so then she went back again a second time, antibiotic and steroid. They prescribed her. And really about halfway through that, she started to feel better. Uh, and then toward the tail end of it, I think she had gone to a shower, North Avenue Church shower, and she had come home from that shower. And she said, Scott, I got bad news. Like the pressure's back in my head. So then she went a third time and got antibiotic and more steroids. But they said, you know, if it doesn't improve, we're gonna have to get you scheduled for a CT scan to see if there's something else uh, wrong. But even, even in that, I could talk about her selflessness, even in that. I mean, looking back and seeing how bad it was and the things she would do, even, even then, uh, her selflessness was on, on display. But so it, it came to the week before the hospital. I think I preached on October 9th, and she mm. didn't even come to hear me preach, which never would happen because she would always be there. But she was just feeling so bad she couldn't even come hear me preach. And really that week of October 9th and 10th and down all the way to the 14th, we ended up at the hospital. But the 13th was Thursday night. That's the worst I'd ever seen her in 12 and a half years of marriage. It was Thursday night, just really bad. And her mom was with us, staying with us providentially. And I remember she was really bad that night. And I, her mom uh, grabbed me and she, came, she said, you know, we, we got to pray. She said, you know, you pray. I'll pray in Spanish. You pray in English. We sat down together. And like, she grabbed my arm and, and she prayed. And I prayed. And uh, I mean, this began lots of prayer. I mean, she, her mom prayed probably more than anybody uh, d during this trial. So, so we prayed that night. And then Saturday, uh, Friday morning, October 14th came. And she was scheduled for the CT, CT scan, but then I'm thinking, you know, she just, she, I don't think she can make the CT scan, we, so I'm, I'm going to have to leave work early. We're going to take her to the, to the emergency room. And uh, I mean, she was so, so weak already at that point. I remember helping her out and helping her out outside. I remember thinking, I mean, th this was the thought that came to mind. I said, will she ever come back? Because it just, it just seemed like this is a very weighty thing. Now, you're praying it's not a weighty thing, but you felt like deep down this is a weighty thing. So we so went to the ER. Uh, she had to get a wheelchair get her in a wheelchair, wait, go back. And there, there were no rooms available at St. Mary's there. We were in the hallway and we spent lots of hours in this hallway and uh, they're giving her IV and, and all these doctors coming to check on her. And then they, they take her finally to do the CT scan and they, they bring her back. And then you wait for the results and you're praying, you know, this is going to be, you know, maybe a sinuses or something else, something more mild. And then I still remember that this doctor comes right up to me and he, he kneels beside me. He said, you know, they, they found this mass in, in her head. And uh, it, it, he said, this explains why all the symptoms are going on. And he said, I'm so glad you guys came in. I had, I had all kinds of questions for him that he couldn't answer lots of my questions. But he said that there's a neurosurgeon. He, we've called him already. He, he's on site. He's headed on site. He'll, he'll meet with you guys uh, in a little bit. And when he said the mass, like, I just wasn't shocked. I just felt like that makes total sense of everything that I've seen in the last several weeks. That just made total sense. Wasn't completely shocked. Now, it's, it's heavy news. 
Uh, so, and then I tell her, you know, they found the mask in her head, and she translates to her mom, and so that you're sitting there, and uh, you're praying, of course, and you're waiting, and then the, the neurosurgeon came. There are two neurosurgeons at St. Mary's, one Dr. Barnes and Dr. Woodall. We had Dr. Woodall most of the time, but this was Dr. Barnes, and he just began to talk to me and explain uh, the situation, and he said, you know, she's got this mass, and I don't even remember if he said the region, the pineal region, which is way down in the middle of her head, and it's three centimeters, and it's pretty big, and, and it's blocking up this... Uh, cerebrospinal fluid is, is backing up. It, it goes around your brain, like cushion your brain. It's backing up, called it, causing something called hydrocephalus. And then he began to talk about how dangerous hydrocephalus is. And he, and he was saying that he's seen people with hydrocephalus fall asleep and go into a coma. That's what he said. And she's, she's fast asleep right there. And I'm just thinking, like, should she be asleep? And he said, no, it's no big deal. But I think right there, that's when you feel that this is really weighty. Uh, when he said that she could go into a coma, uh, he's seen people go into a coma with this condition. So he said, we got to get her for an MRI, detailed MRI, and then we got to take her for a surgery and put this shunt in to, to relieve the, this fluid. But this is where you're, you're feeling like this is very heavy, but we had, uh, we had been, I'd been studying Romans 8 because I was teaching uh, Romans 8 for, and what, what better chapter to, to be studying providentially than Romans 8? And we'd, been, we'd gone through Romans 8, 28, maybe a month or so before. And I had just read, uh, I'll just read Romans 8, 28. This is such a stabilizing verse, especially in suff- suffering. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And I'd read from John Piper. He has this great, this great quote. I got to read from Piper. It was, this was fresh in my mind, this, this Piper quote. Piper talking about Romans 8, 28, really all the promises in Romans 8 that you could, you could apply this to. But he, he says this, if you live inside this massive promise, your life will be, is more solid and stable than Mount Everest. Nothing can blow you over when you're inside the walls of Romans 8, 28. Outside Romans 8, 28 is all confusion and anxiety and fear and uncertainty. Once you walk through the door of love into the massive, unshakable structure of Romans 8.28, everything changes. There comes your life stability and depth and freedom. You simply can't be blown over anymore. The confidence that a sovereign God governs for your good, all the pain and all the pleasure that you will ever experience is an incomparable refuge and security and hope and power in your life. So that was fresh on my mind. And so I knew I've got to stay in the promises. I've got to stay in here. I'll be more secure than Mount Everest if I stay in the promises. But I felt like at some point in the beginning of that trial, maybe after the coma, when you said the coma thing, I remember it was as if God took me to the edge of the mountain to, and put my ear to the, to the wall of the mountain to feel like the intensity of the storm, almost as if I could put my hand outside. This storm is intense. It was as if God was saying, if you go outside in your own strength, you will be swept away in your own strength. You're not going to make it through this trial. So stay in the promises. There's security in the promises. And and by God's grace, I stayed in the promises. And I mean, over and over, we come back to to Romans 8, 28. So they they, they do the MRI, they come back, and now they got the surgery is going to be planned. And they finally get her ready for the surgery. They take her off for the surgery. They take us up to the waiting area. And this would be the first surgery that she would go through, an intense surgery. And and you wait and you wait. I I remember I'd taken taken a bunch of tissue and I'd gone through them all even before we had gone back there. I mean, you're, you're praying, it's promises, everything is in Romans 8, 28. It's all rolling around in, in your brain. And then you're waiting uh, in the waiting room. You have no appetite whatsoever. And uh, this, my appetite went away for weeks, I think. Uh, no appetite. You're forcing yourself to eat, praying and waiting. And then that was the first surgery. And that was like maybe the only surgery, the, all of the ones that she had that was successful. So successful surgery. Uh, this is like nine o'clock at night. They're going to finally get her a room, seventh floor, uh, and we, we go up there, we're waiting to get called back there, and we go back there, and we see her, uh, she looked pretty good, and this was the best she would look, would be the beginning, and her mom came to me, and she, she just said, if, if anybody can stay, over, stay overnight in the room, I want to be the one who stays, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing with her, this is the person I would choose above anybody in the world, I would choose her mom, I mean, just, she didn't leave, uh, any night, and she will be rewarded immensely, I'm sure, for her sacrificial love. So she's going to stay the night. And so then I go home. It's uh, probably, I mean, it's 12 hours at the hospital, basically, tw- get home. And uh, Michael's not there because he's with my parents. The house is quiet. I mean, memories flood you. And I remember lying down, and my experience was that of David's. Very different. Like the, the result was the same as David in Psalm 6. Uh, David says this in Psalm 6, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping, my eye waste away because of grief. I I mean, just tears just were streaming down my face. And I thought of David. Man, this is exactly what, what I'm going through right now. But in that moment, I begin to think about like these what if questions begin to flood your mind. Like what if, what if, what if, what if all these things happen? And what I realized was in, as I'm asking all these what if questions, 
I realized all of a sudden, I realized the sin of anxiety is, is crouching at my door. It's about to devour me if I let it devour me. So I just, I was like, whoa, this is sin. This is real sin is coming, it's about to attack me. I cannot go here. So what do you do? What do you do in that moment when uh, sin is crouching at your door in that moment? Well, I, I went to the word of God. Let me just go where I went. I, I grabbed my phone, actually. It was it's dark and... Uh, I went to Matthew 6, you go to Philippians 4 as well, but I went to Matthew 6, and I'll just read what I read that night. Matthew 6, uh, 20, verse, for, starting verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In verse 34, this is where I would camp over and over again. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So I, I pulled out the sword of the Spirit and, and made war on that sin. And I would just say, we, we need, I think John Piper said, you need specific promises for specific sin issues in your life. You, you, need, you need them. I, this for anxiety, Matthew 6, 34, or Philippians 4, for anxiety, or whatever. Uh, Piper also said you need like a, a one that's like one size fits all. Isaiah 41, 10, I love Isaiah 41, 10. You can throw it in, like, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I mean, throw in a promise like that. But, but we need to, to fight uh, sin with the word of God. And after that, fighting that sin, I, I went to bed and was able to sleep. Uh, but that, that was the first day, long answer that question. No, that's, that's very helpful to hear that. And uh, I've got written down that it was Friday, October 21st is when the cancer diagnosis came. Um, I guess I found out, I think, the following morning. So can you talk about Friday finding out that it was malignant? Yeah. Uh, and even before I get there, I would just say, I think it was that the, the first night coming home, uh, I jumped on the computer and providentially I saw that Elizabeth Elliot quote. Uh, it moved me to tears that first night. I came back to it again and again. I'll read it. Jerry Edgar loves this quote. Uh, where, where Elizabeth Elliot says this, he being God is always doing something, the very best thing, the thing we ourselves would certainly choose if we knew the end from the beginning. He is at work to bring us to our full glory. I mean, I can't, I mean, God gave me that as a gift, I think, that night, but I came back to that over and over again. I would, I would sit there in the hospital and think, I would never choose this. And I would think, no, I would. If I knew the end from the beginning, this is exactly how I would choose it because of all the good that God's going to do through this. So, I mean, that's a stabilizing. I mean, she's using basically the word of God, drawing from the word of God there. So I had that that first night. But I think that week of, they were going to have the second surgery. There's going to be this intense surgery. They were going to go, you know, way down and they're going to open up a passageway for this hydrocephalus uh, to, to relieve pressure. Uh, third ventriculotomy, something like that. They're going to open up underneath and open up this passageway. And while they're way down there, they're going to turn around. He said he was going to grab some samples from the mass itself and then come out. And that was an intense day. I think the whole church was praying. I was hour, your hours waiting, you're praying, you're waiting. Uh, I was listening to like hymns and stuff, trying to, to make it through. And then you, she, he called Dr. Woodall, who was a, a tremendous neurosurgeon and nothing but just wonderful things to say about Dr. Woodall. And he just said it was a successful surgery. You know, she's going to come back up there. And so she comes back up there, successful surgery. Everything seems good. And then those next several days, you're waiting for the pathologist to, to look at uh, the samples to see what this is. And you're, you're praying, you know, this is not going to be cancerous. You're, you're praying this would be benign and all, the, all these things you're praying. And you're feeling hopeful. You're feeling like, you know, this surgery, hopefully this thing will be successful. The hydrocephalus is going to clear up and then she's going to be able to get home, get strength back. And you have to monitor the mass itself. That's what you're feeling. But October 21st came and uh, he came into our room in the afternoon and I can see him. Uh, he's leaning against the, the sink area in our room and he just, uh, he's pretty weighty, serious. And he just tells us, uh, you know, it's the pathologist had looked over this. It looks like it's glioblastoma. This is a, this is a malignant cancer. This is grade four cancer. It's aggressive cancer. And not only it looks like it's in her, her, her head, it looks like it's in her spine already. Now, they don't know for sure, but it looks like it's in her spine. And uh, he said, I wish I had better news. Stay hopeful. And I asked him all kinds of questions like chemo, radiation. Do we have to try to get this out? And ask him lots of questions. And he just said, stay hopeful. And he left. And I remember I, I raced around over to by her bed and... Uh,
you're just man, talking about the news and everything. And she, I mean, her, her faith already. I mean, she, at that point, she said she was scared early on. And even there, she would say, like, this is heavy news. But she said, I, want to, I want to trust God. I mean, that's what she would say. But then I, I remember got my phone out and I started researching glioblastoma. And you're, you're reading and everything I'm reading. Like, this is absolutely intense. Like, it's, it, it doesn't get any weightier. I mean, the, the, the average life expectancy uh, is one to two years. And, and he, I have to tell her, you know, this is what I'm reading. And so I told her that, and she just, I mean, again, she just, uh, she trusted God. She, she was just like, this is weighty, this is heavy news. And she's, wow. Uh, she, so she wants to trust God. I'm sure I prayed with her. Uh, I prayed with her many nights there and sweet times. And then I went home. I'm going to blow my nose again here. Oof. Went home that night and uh, saw my parents. I can't say anything to them right now. I got to put Michael to bed, which I did. And my parents left. And Michael finally went to sleep. And I, I, I came downstairs. I, again, I don't want to sugarcoat any of this. Uh, came downstairs. And I, I mean, I literally f- collapsed. On the, on the floor, and I wept like I've never wept uh, in my life, I don't think. And you pray for help, for strength. And I, I got up and went to the kitchen. And I, tried to, I got to compose myself. I got to, I got to call. I probably got to call my parents. I got to call Mark, probably, if I can. And so I went to the kitchen, composed myself, felt like, okay, I got some strength back. I came around again. I crumbled again to the floor. And then I got up again. I thought, okay. You know, I, I, I got to make these calls. And then I was like wrestling. Do, do I call or not? I got to blow my nose again. Uh, do I call or not? And I was like, if I, if I call, my parents are not going to sleep. <laughs> if I don't call, they're going to be mad that I didn't call. I got to call. So I, I did. Uh, I finally, I was praying, getting ready to call. I called. My mom answered the phone. And then uh, my mom said, it's probably better if you talk to your dad. I thought, I mean, it turned out providentially that that is definitely the right, the right call. Uh, and so then I tried to get it out, talking to my dad, and uh, I had a hard time getting it all out. It's saying, you know, it's, it's malignant cancer. It looks like it's in the spine. I'm barely getting this out. And then uh, my dad started talking, and he doesn't get emotional easily, and he's getting emotional. So I was like, oh, man, this is a mess. Uh, we're both getting emotional here. And uh, then uh, dad said that w- when he was in Bible college, his favorite teacher was a guy named Buck Hatch. And I think dad took every class that Buck Hatch taught, and one of the classes that Buck Hatch did was... Uh, I guess studying Ezekiel. They were studying Ezekiel, and I, I got to read this. Ver- I mean, this this verse is exactly what happened to me. This, I think this is probably the passage they were going to study uh, when when God takes Ezekiel's wife. But here it's in Ezekiel 24, uh, 15, the beginning of 16. This is this is the passage I think they were studying. God speaking, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. I mean, that's what happened to me. Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. That's what happened to, to Ezekiel. And this is the passage they're going to study. And so Buck Hatch said he wanted the entire class to pray before they studied this passage, my dad said, because he didn't want anybody in the class thinking bad thoughts about God. He didn't want anybody thinking bad thoughts about God. So they wanted them all to pray before they, they went to this passage. And so then my dad said that his, his prayer for me, his prayer for uh, my mom, his prayer really for him and, and for our family was that none of us would think bad thoughts about God. And God was faithful to answer that, that prayer. Uh, and I don't think any of us thought bad thoughts about God. And here, here's the key point. We, we cannot waver on this point. We cannot waver on this point. We, we cannot think bad thoughts about God because if you do, you're undone. I mean, you're going to be undone. In, in Genesis chapter 22, God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his, his only son, his son he loves, on the altar. And I'm borrowing this and I'm sort of making it my own. But the idea is that Abraham was absolutely certain about the trustworthiness of God. Unwavering on the trustworthiness of God. But he was uncertain on the, on the details. He does not know how this is all going to work out. Is he actually going to have to kill his son? Is God going to raise his son if he kills his son? Maybe. He doesn't know. Or is God going to miraculously pro- provide this ram? He has no idea of all these details. But he's absolutely unwavering on the trustworthiness of God. Well, the same was true, again, for me. I got to be unwavering on the trustworthiness of God. But there, there was all kinds of things I'm praying, all kinds of things I'm uncertain about for the future, all kinds of things I pray that God did not answer the way that I was asking him to pray in, in particular. 
all kinds of things I was saying. I, I won't go into the details of those, but tons of things I asked God he did not do. But even though he didn't answer the prayers the way that I wanted him to answer, it doesn't change the fact that he was always only doing good to me the entire time. Always. All of that, he never wavered in his goodness to me. All undeserved goodness. He is good and he does good to me. And so again, this, this point is, if we, if we begin to waver and we think bad thoughts about God, we're just not going to make it through the suffering. But if we are absolutely assur- assured about the trustworthiness of God, it will not matter on the details so much because we know that God is, is only ever good and doing good to us. And so, uh, yeah, that, that, I couldn't even call you after, after the call. And I told them that they would tell, tell you and, and Chris the next morning. For the next question, um, can you talk a little bit about, and this may be hard, I know you said, but uh, talking about Michael and uh, some, of the, some of the issues he's had, just trying to understand what's happened. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely the hardest one. I mean, I've, I've already cried a good bit tonight, so maybe I can say, I just say at the beginning, I wanted to say, uh, oh, I'm, gonna, if, if, I'm just thinking if Michael watches this in 10 years, I would just say, I love you. That's all I can say. But uh, I would just say, if you could put yourself in his shoes, if you can. You're, he just turned four. He had a great day yesterday. He turned four yesterday. But he, he's three. So you're, you're three years old. The person you spend more time with than, oh man, than, than anyone is taken from you. And you will not see her for weeks. Your dad is taken away basically all the time, and you see him in the morning and night sometimes. Your schedule that you thrive on is gone, totally upended. Like the snack time, we would do snack time every day during the week. Daddy and I, I mean, Daddy and Michael do snack time, 45 minutes. We had a great time, and it's gone. Like, it's gone. His whole schedule is gone. You're three years old. How do you, how do you respond? Well, the way that he, he had, I think, lots of pent-up frustration, the way he responded, he would literally scream over and over again. He would scream. At, at me mainly, I think he, I think I'm the, I mean maybe at my parents a little bit, but he screamed at me like intensely, and like you don't even know how to, you have no idea how to handle the situation. I didn't handle it well at the beginning, but at some point I just realized I just need to comfort him and tell him like I would just grab him and squeeze him like I love you, and, and you cannot stop him from yelling and crying and yelling and no no he would say no 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 just and you're just holding him trying to tell him you, you love him. But I remember one particular time, I, I gotta blow this again. It was the week, weekend of the fall festival, I think, that was here. He was excited to go to it, but he got the flu that week, so he couldn't go. And then he threw up, like he hadn't thrown up ever. He threw up like all over himself, his traumatic thing. Uh, he did not sleep well. I think it was the day, it was Sunday afternoon, I think. And uh, he hadn't slept, he'd been sick. He'd thrown up, I think, multiple times now. And he just, he went into one of his fits, like just yelling and inconsolable, no, 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 just yelling all around. And I've never felt so weak and helpless, telling him I love him, I don't know what to do. I literally had no idea what to do. So I'm at the top of the stairs, and I just said, I'm going to start praying out loud so he can hear me. So I just start praying, you know, Lord, help us, comfort him, sustain us, strengthen us. Like, I am totally help. I, have, I have nothing that I can do to, to help him. Like, please help. So I'm praying out loud, and at some point, he comes over next to me. He, he lies down next to me, and he's like, he starts stopping crying, and he's like, his stomach is just, in, he's just heaving in and out, and he falls asleep next to me as I'm praying out loud. He, he, he passes out totally asleep. Well, what, what is happening there? It's 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says this, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. One pastor said, God uses our weakness as a platform for his glory. I just saw this uh, from Al Mohler. He said, when trials do come, God often uses them to decrease our dependence on our own strength and increase our reliance upon his power. I think God was powerfully reminding me of my own weakness and my dependence upon him, which is a wonderful place to be. 
to be weak in ourselves. It's so often we, we think we can do this on our own, but we need to be reminded again and again that we cannot. Apart from me, you can't do nothing, Jesus said. So we need to be reminded of our weakness, dependence upon God. And I think another thing God was impressing upon me was he knew I was going to get all kinds of attention. People were going to say all kinds of positive things. And he was going to say, it's as if he was saying, do not steal my glory. Do not rob my glory. When people say things, remember this moment and remember to be quick to point to me and to my glory and to my sustaining grace. And so when she died and when the funeral came up, I knew I had to speak at it because God was giving me this golden opportunity to point to his, his glory. Uh, so I just came back to 2 Corinthians 12 again and again. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect and weakness, and I, I felt that in a profound way, uh, especially with Michael. You mentioned that, uh, you said church history, studying church history has helped you prepare, not knowing exactly what you were preparing for, but preparing for suffering in general. Can you talk about the church history factor? Yeah, I mean, I, as I thought about this, I thought so many things have prepared me for the suffering, the, 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 the home we grew up in, the parents that we had, my dad's preaching for so many years, is so powerful, the impact on me. Uh, I, Jerry Edgar's not here. I can talk about Jerry. Like Jerry's life, <laughs> like he, for I don't know how many years I've known him. I've known him for a long time. But I mean, if, if you were around Jerry Edgar for two weeks or two minutes, really, he's going to make a profound impact on you. I'm sure like Jerry's life, his trust, absolute trust, immense suffering. I'm sure all these things help prepare me. But certainly studying people in church history who suffered well, like really suffered well. And I, to, I immediately went to all kinds of people in church history that, that I can, here's just different people who lost their spouses, John Patton, George Mueller, Elizabeth Elliott, Adoniram Judson, Andrew Bonar, all these people like thinking about them. Uh, I'll just drill. I mean, George Mueller, I stole his funeral message like for, for mine. I knew like his, his life is just so powerful, but John Patton, I'll just mention John Patton. I love him. Uh, he went to cannibals, violent people group, uh, no exposure basically to the gospel. The first missionaries who went there, they killed them and ate them. Uh, and Patton, just such courage, a spiritual moxie, I think is what, what John Piper says about him. It just, I went back and listened to Piper's thing on, on Patton. I had to, because I, I wanted to hear about when, when he lost his wife. But he goes to this, this very difficult people group. His wife is pregnant. They get there. And soon after they get there, she gives birth to, to a son. And his wife dies. And he, she, he has to dig her grave and, and bury, bury her. And then, uh, I'll I just give it to you in John Patton's word which I, I, oh, this is just so good. He said, then in a moment, all together, unexpectedly, she died on March 3rd. To crown my sorrows and complete my loneliness, the dear baby boy whom we had named after her father, Peter Robert Robson, was taken from me after one week's sickness on the 20th of March. So like less than three weeks, he loses his wife and child. Let those who have ever passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me. As for all others, it would be more than vain to try to paint my sorrows. He continues, stunned by that dreadful loss and entering upon this field of labor, labor to which the Lord had himself so evidently led me, my reason seemed for a time almost to give way. He's almost going to lose his mind, but then he gives this wonderful sentence. The ever merciful Lord sustained me. I mean, I would just say anyone in this room who's gone through any kind of trial can just repeat this. The ever merciful Lord sustains you. And in that spot, that, that the graves became my sacred and much frequented shrine during all the following months and years. When I labored on for the salvation of the savage islanders amidst difficulties, dangers, and deaths, but for Jesus and the fellowship he vouchsafed to me there, I must have gone mad and died beside the lonely grave. And I'll just mention one other person. I'll mention Archibald Brown. He actually lost, I think, multiple wives. I think this was his second wife he lost, and he was in deep grief, and he was really good friends with Charles Spurgeon. He'd studied at Spurgeon's pastor's college. He said he couldn't preach that Sunday. Uh, he said I could go and I could sing. So he went to Spurgeon's church. And Spurgeon changed his entire message just to comfort Archibald Brown, like changed the entire message. And he found it out like as he left and he, and he spent the whole afternoon with, with Archibald Brown, but he, he, Spurgeon like grabbed Archibald Brown after preaching the sermon. He said, brother, I did everything I could for you. Like, and, but this is what I would say. Uh, I feel like that's, that's this church. North Avenue Church is like, grabbed a hold of me. We did everything we could for you, but we, we have, we've prayed for you. We, we've upheld you. We, we've served you in every way. We want to do whatever we can uh, for you. But I, I would just say again, Church history is a wonderful thing. Re reading Christian biography, it will help you in, it will help in your sanctification, but it will help in, especially in suffering. You're seeing people honor God in suffering. I mean, your mind will go to them and see how do they honor God? And it's the same God who sustained John Patton, the same God who, who, who's with us. And uh, yeah, so church history is just a wonderful thing to, to help in suffering. I'm sure you've heard people say this. I heard someone say this about you. Uh, just, I, I can't, people say, I can't imagine what it's like to go through that. I don't know what my faith would do. I feel like my faith collapses over a very small trial what you're going through is, is a massive trial. Um, if someone feels like, I just can't, there's no way I could make it through something like that, how would you encourage them? Yeah, I mean, I would say 2 Corinthians 12, his grace is sufficient for you. Certainly go, go to the promises. But I think of the, the illustration that Corey Ten Boom tells, I think, I think she, she 
she was thinking when she was a kid, something about being a Christian martyr, and she was thinking about, there's no way I could ever be a Christian martyr. And she went to her dad saying, you know, how in the world could I ever do that? I don't think I could ever, you know, die for the faith. And, and her dad sat her down on the, on the edge of the bed and said, Corey, when you and I go to Amsterdam, when do I give you your ticket? She said, I sniffed a few times considering this. Why? Just before we get on the train. Exactly. And our wise father in heaven knows when we're going to need things too. So we'll, we, he gives us the ticket when we get on the train. He, it's like he gives you sustaining grace when that suffering comes. He, he will sustain you. Uh, there's, there's a hymn that goes like this. He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labors increase to added afflictions. He addeth his mercy to multiply trials. He multiplies peace. So this is what I would say. If you are a Christian, a genuine child of God, and I would say if you're a member of this church, I would say the Lord will sustain you his grace will be sufficient for you. He will stir up people in the church to pray, like probably like they've never prayed before. He will drive you to your knees. He'll drive you to the word of God. And the promises in the, God, promises in the Bible will radiate off the page and his grace will be sufficient for you. He will sustain you. Uh, if, you were, if you are a child of God, like he, he will, even you think it's unimaginable, but again, it's that, that ticket, he'll give it to you when you get on the train. Like if he calls you to go through that, he will give you grace to sustain you through that. One of the earlier conversations Scott and I had about what was happening was one night after all of our kids were in bed mm-hmm. and you were talking about the verse in John, uh, Matthew 6 about sufficient to the day is its own trouble. And um, Scott was deliberately forcing himself, I could tell, because maybe I was tempting you to not do that. Because I, I was trying to think, like, I, I was trying to think what, long term, what could this look like? I was kind of pushing into the future, which I probably shouldn't have been doing, but thinking that way. And you were, you were kind of saying, yeah, we need to think about that, but I need to think about sufficient to the day is its own trouble because it was so over, each day was so overwhelming that to think about six months from now is, is just not going, you, you can't humanly sustain all that in one moment. So what do I need to do for the next hour? What do I need to do for the next day, the next week? And you were thinking about even those operations that were going on, like, I can't so much think about what the repercussions of the cancer could be in a year. I need to be thinking about right now we got to deal with the fluid on the brain and we got to deal with the very next step in front of us. I, I, it's going to overwhelm us to think overly and to be stressed out overly by all that, that is coming. Um, for the next question, uh, obviously Liliana's faith uh, in the hospital in particular, but uh, it's been moving for all of us as you've talked about it at the memorial service and whatnot, but can you talk a little bit more about how her faith was growing stronger toward, toward the end? Oh, yeah. Uh... I mean, the, the very, very, very beginning, I think maybe the first day or two, she said to me, like, maybe it was the second day, she just said, she said, Scott, the, the verse I'm thinking about, I've been meditating on Psalm 138.8, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. I mean, they, they just, her faith already uh, was clearly on display. I mean, Mark, you said at, the, at the, the service that, like, she loved the word of God, she loved the people of God, and uh, you just saw that. I mean, I've gone through her, some of her stuff and just see, like, all these Bible memory verses and, like, her notes, and it's just like, she loved the Bible, uh, yeah, she loved the Word of God, but, but seeing her, like her contentment, for example, was extraordinary. Her peace, like, I, I talked about this in the memorial service, but I, if you weren't there to see her up close, you, you would never have imagined how bad, like, the suffering was, like, how intense the suffering was. Uh, it was just so intense. Like, the first surgery, I think, was successful, and then a bunch of surgeries, I don't know, five, six l- later, it's like, all kinds of problems every time, like major problems would happen. I mean, infection, she may have even had the infection before. And then there, there's, uh, there's leakage in the spot here. Like she was all, like, she was all ready to go home and then, oh, you can't go home. There can't be any leakage. Then there's an infection. All these, these, uh, these things were, were happening. Uh, complications were happening. And I remember Dr. Woodall would say, you know, the, the percentage of this, this particular complication is very small. And then she would get it. She would get it. And then by the end of it, he was saying, you know, these, this is pretty small. He said, I'm starting to think she gets everything. Like she gets every complication. So he said, I'm not going to say anything. I mean, just all these complications. And you would think that people would be irritable, irritable, irritable or just frustrated, just like, ah, like some kind of sign. None of that. There was just none. She was just totally content. Just had, had peace. Uh, the one I told her at the memorial service, when she, she was so, so sick, and the infection, her eyes, she couldn't see. Like at some point she couldn't text anymore. She couldn't see her eyes were jumping around. She couldn't even read uh, well. Her, her thumb was moving around and uh, her sodium levels were dangerously low. And she had like, she had this whole team of doctors. Many doctors she hadn't even met. They would come in, like all these random doctors talking, introducing themselves. You don't even know who they are and checking the sodium levels. And then she's having to take these sodium tablets and, and wanting to throw up and, like again. And she's, she can hardly get up. I mean, how weak she was at the very end. I remember, I remember going to the hospital and she had, a, she had a chair next to her hospital bed, and I came, and she was sitting in the chair. I was stunned. I was like, how, how in the world is she sitting in the chair? Like, she has no strength. How did they get her in the chair? But now the thing is, we have to get her from the chair back to the bed. And so we, we tried to get her back 
from the chair, I mean, just three feet. And she, try, she tries to stand up, and I mean, she's hooked to the heart monitor and everything, and she tries to stand up, and her, her heart rate skyrockets. Just trying to stand up, her heart rate is 140s, and going crazy. And she's I, no, I can't. And I, she sits back down. So we had it. We had it. Was both of us helping her, the nurse and I helping her. We had to get this, this fancy chair in there to get her where she can hold it and, and get her where she can sit back, and we turn around and get her back on the bed. I mean, that's not just how weak she was. You could hardly. Uh, I mean, I saw her calf muscles. Her calf muscles were like non-existent. I mean, just she was lost so much weight, so weak. And she's incredibly weak, and yet she's wanting to throw up again. She can hardly lift up her head, and you're, you're trying to help her with a throw-up bag, and yet no complaining. I mean, just no complaining. I mean, we should be challenged by, by her, her, her trust. Uh, not a single complaint, but I'll just read from First Peter. I feel like this is what was going on. First Peter chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, her faith was being tested by fire, and it was coming out just, I mean, pure and radiant. The dross was being burned off, and her faith just kept, kept growing and growing. And I remember... When it was very serious and it looked like, I mean, heaven is coming rapidly for her. And I remember talking to her and I told her a story about a pastor who had gotten very sick and it looked like he was going to die. And he, he was getting very excited about heaven when he was so sick. And he said, all of a sudden, like the Lord uh, healed him. And he said he was actually kind of upset that the Lord had healed him. He was so excited about heaven. And I told this story to her and she was like, can you tell it to me again? Like, like she, she wanted to be there and I, I, she wanted to have that same happiness, that same excitement. I feel like by the end, she, she had that excitement for heaven. She, she was ready uh, for heaven, and, and certainly when, when Jerry Ediger came that Sunday. Mm. Uh, that's, tell, tell that again. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that Sunday night, I don't even remember which day, I mean, you, you may remember the day when, I mean, Jerry had been wanting to come since the very beginning. And then I think it was a Sunday night after church, right? Sunday night after church, yeah, I'd given him, and he, he was ready to come, and uh, Jerry Ediger up there on the seventh floor comes into a room, and he's, he's bumping into stuff with his wheelchair, <laughs> he's like smacking into stuff, like, oh man, this whole place is going to come, come down with Jerry in here, because he wants to get like really close, and he got really close. Uh, and then uh, Liliana's mom came over and grabbed her hand, and like he held her hand, and uh, he just he, he was reading scripture. I, I got to get to the passage though that Mark you've been preaching on, but uh, he just began to read. I mean, Jerry Edgar in those settings is like <sighs> it, it's, it's a gold mine to have Jerry Edgar. I mean, people I just watching John Piper on Providence, and he was saying that. People will say, you know, God is sovereign and, and in control. It means you, you never cry. He says, that's nonsense. That's like Jesus wept at the tomb. Uh, and, and, and Piper talked about somebody losing their son. He just wept with him. That, uh, Jerry Edgar was just like grabbing Liliana's mom and like uh, her brother. And just, they're all weeping with Jerry. Like he's just so good in those settings. I remember when her dad came, he, he grabbed her dad and was like yanking him forward. Like, come in close. You got to come in for a hug with, with me. He's just so, so good. I mean, so gifted in those settings. But he just began to read, and everybody's crying around there. He's reading scripture. He's re reading all these wonderful passages. But he's reading, I mean, 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, I mean, I'll just read a chunk of it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars, jars of clay to show that the su surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. And in these two verses, I mean these three verses, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And her face was literally like lighting up. It looks so radiant. And she's mouthing these words. I mean, I was just stunned. She, she knows these by memory. And she's mouthing the words as Jerry is, is saying them. It's just like she knows that heaven is, is a reality that is sure and certain. She's so close there. And she's so joyful. And Jerry just said she had the peace that passes understanding. Uh, it, it, that was just an incredible night. I just felt like her faith is at this extraordinary level right now. Because you, you'd said when you had read scripture, you weren't often able to see her face when you're reading yeah, the scripture. Yeah, down, but when yeah. Jerry was reading, you were able to I look directly at her right face at her. and to see her mouthing the words and to see that she was obviously trusting deeply in those promises. Oh yeah. No, I know. Yeah. It was, yeah, that was incredible to see her faith in that.
Yeah. So going along with this, you, you talked about the verse sorrowful yet always rejoicing, which is in the next uh, two chapters later in 2 Corinthians. Um, you said that at first, obviously, the sorrow is the thing that you feel primarily probably at the, the early stages, but as time went on, the joy was sort of coming to overtake the sorrow. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was before, like towards, towards the end, it was November, I think, night. It was a Wednesday night, and the cancer doctor had finally come to talk to us, and he was talking about how weak she was, and he was like, man, she's got to get her strength up, and they were, so they were going to give her a feeding tube that night, but they also were going to do an MRI to see if the cancer was really in the spine. Mm. This was Wednesday night, uh, November 9th. The cancer doctor was like, I don't know if there's been evidence that it's in the spine. I was like, really? There's no, it's not in the spine, so th this is this big night. They're going to do this MRI. So they do it, and that Thursday, I think it was November 10th, she went to hospice November 18th, but it was November 10th, and it was before 12, Dr. Woodall called me, and like, that was the weightiest call. He just said, I mean, this is like the, fin the finality of it. He just said, uh, they did the MRI. It, it, there's been significant spread in her head and in her spine. And it, she has, you know, weeks to months left. She had two weeks left, and we didn't know that, but he said weeks to months left. And I remember hanging up the phone, and I, I remember just weeping again. And I remember I kept track of it eight days in a row. I wept for eight days in a row every day. But then one, by the time she was beginning to go to hospice, something began to change. Tim Challies describes it as sort of sorrow is sort of like whitewater rapids. It's just, it can overtake you. It's just powerful. Wave upon wave can just crush into you. And, but he said that joy is more like, it's like the, the, the whitewater rapids going way down to this peaceful stream. And then there's like a lake down there. He said the joy is just this peaceful stream. And that's how it is. But I felt like the, the, the peaceful streams of joy began to overtake the sorrow. And I would explain it like this. Like how, how, can, how in the world in something like this can, you, can joy begin to overtake the sorrow? Well, because we know where she's going. We, we know for certain where, where she's going because of the hope we have, because of the righteousness of Jesus, she's going to fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Like it's the certainty, the hope of the gospel. You begin to get excited about she's going to get no more pain, no more sin, no more death. Uh, she's going to be with her Savior whom she loves, who loves her. Like John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to take you there to that, that place. So you're thinking more and more about where, where she's headed. And I remember driving to hospice, maybe it was a day or two before she died. I remember looking up and it was a beautiful day. It was uh, blue sky and some, some clouds. The sun is blazing out there. I just remember thinking, is today the day she meets Jesus? I mean, just, like, the one who made everything. Is this the day that she's going to stand before Jesus and he's going to say, well done, you know, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. And I remember thinking that and just feeling so joyful, like she's so close to, to meeting Jesus. You're seeing the glory of Jesus and he's about to welcome her home. And so the joy just begins to, to surge. And I remember R.C. Sproul was with his mentor, John Gerstner, who was an intense man, and they were walking together. He said Gerstner was a little bit taller than him, and he was walking very fast and out in front of him. And Sproul was behind, and Sproul made some comment, kind of like a joke comment about somebody had made some, some remark, bad theology. And he just said, if Jonathan Edwards heard that, he would be turning over in his grave, is what Sproul said. And he said, Gerstner stopped dead in his tracks, turned around, and he said, absolutely nothing could impact the happiness of Jonathan Edwards right now. And then Sproul was like, I'm just making a joke. Like, I'm just making a joke. But I love that. Nothing can impact the happiness of Jonathan Edwards. And I've gone back to that. Like, Michael will say, Daddy, is Mommy happy? I was like, oh, yes, Mommy is happy. She's fullness of joy. Pleasure forevermore. Nothing can impact her happiness. Like, absolutely nothing. When I, when I remember at the memorial service, I said, she's going to miss all these things. Well, I'm not thinking biblically. It's all gay. Like, to depart and be with Christ is it's not only is better, it is far better. And so I feel like even now, if I, if I get sad, which I can, and weep, I have to go to joy. Like, if I don't end in joy, something's wrong, because where she is, she's with her Savior. It's a temporary parting. It's forever going to see her again. Uh, so again, it's the hope we have in Christ. How can you not have joy? Uh, because she was covered. There was no condemnation for her. Jesus is welcome to her own. She fought the fight. She finished the race. There's no sin, no pain. She's awaiting her resurrected body uh, that death cannot touch, cancer cannot touch. Yeah. I, I was talking to Jerry uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we both said that it was like getting the most incredible uh, discipleship on how to die well that you could possibly imagine. Uh, that for, for like a, a, almost like a selfish personal takeaway for me is like, obviously we're all scared of death. There's, 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 uh, death, death to me is genuinely a frightening thing for obvious reasons and it, it's something you think about and seeing how the Lord sustained Liliana through that, it really has helped me feel like, you know, by God's grace, this is something that believers really can do. We, we really can have that peace of God that goes beyond understanding. We really can endure to the end. We really can be brought all the way through to the other side. Um, so I, I feel like that's one of the greatest things. I mean, Lil I learned many things from Liliana, from her kindness to all kinds of things that we've talked about, but that's the thing that just more than anything else is going to stay with me is just her incredible trust in the Lord through the whole of that, of those, of those couple of months uh, at the end. 
we, we've got a few minutes left here. Can you talk a little bit about evidences of God's goodness in this trial? Obviously, you've mentioned some of them, but evidences of God's goodness. Oh, man, they're, they're all over the place. Which I, you could talk even some about your own family. I mean, everybody could tell stories, uh, I think. But, I mean, I, somebody had said about our church that they'd never been in a church where they, they saw people love each other, like our church loves each other. I think multiple people said, Jerry just said, it, it, this trial was knitting people together in love, like in a profound sense at our church, like never before. Uh, it, causing people to pray like never before. And people were just saying they're praying constantly. People saying their alarms, praying all the time. I mean, literally thousands of prayers being made. Uh, certainly, it, it forces you to think about eternity. Mm -hmm. think, think about heaven. Like heaven is closer than, than we realize. You're, you're thinking about it all the time. It's provided many opportunities for parents to talk with their kids about, about heaven, about Christ's second coming. Chad Keeter, he, he wrote me uh, a letter not long ago, and their son just turned four too. And he just said that their son Caleb is asked ask all the time, can we pray for Scott? Can we pray for Michael? Like, isn't that that's evidence of God's goodness? He said they talk about uh, Christ's second advent all the time. I've talked with Michael about Christ's return all the time, and he's thinking about it. He's talking about it. I mean, that's evidence of, of God's goodness. Uh, thinking about her life has inspired so many people. I could, I could read things that people have written uh, about her who've never even met her, have been inspired by her to live a life of godliness. One, one person said this, I watched her funeral yesterday. It was a beautiful service. And Liliana's testimony spurred me to want to know Jesus deeper. I mean, you could just multiply that out so many times. I mean, the last I checked, her funeral service had been watched 1,800 times, or more than 1,800 times. I wouldn't be surprised if in heaven we meet some people who were converted watching that service. I mean, that's God's goodness. I, there was a, one of my coworkers came, or a couple of my coworkers came to, to the service, and he, he said that it was the most powerful service he'd been to in the last few years. And he mentioned this in a meeting with non Christians at, at my work, just talking about it, talking about Liliana's life. That's God's goodness. Uh, some people say it's the, the most powerful ser funeral they've ever been to. Some, uh, some people from Faith Prez had said that. Again, this is, this is evidence of, of God's goodness. Uh, I mean, just making you think about eternal things, about like your own mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, so many things that I could say uh, on that. I don't know how much more time let me, we let have. Let me jump in yeah. just with one there. Um, this is this. I mean, this is so obvious now. I don't even need to tell you guys this, but it shows the immense practicality of a biblical worldview. This is not just academic. Like reading our Bible is not academic. It's not about showing off. It's not about knowing more than another person. Like, how are you going to survive? How am I going to survive a trial like this if I don't have the mountain, like you said, this, to hide within? Like the, the, the mountain of God's promises. So doctrine which can become this sort of esoteric, detached from real life sort of thing, it's, it's the most practical thing imaginable, that Jesus is alive, that he's ruling, that he's sovereign, that he's good. To believe that is a matter of, of spiritual life and death when you're facing death. It, it's, it's like, how do you make it through if you don't know that this is true and you don't believe it deeply? So just... Scott wouldn't say this because it would embarrass him and Liliana probably too, but they've just, they've spent so many years in solid books and scripture and Bible study and community and around godly older saints who've walked through difficult trials. That all was building up over the years, sanctifying your thinking, sanctifying your affections, sanctifying how you think and how you deal with worry and how your instincts on how to deal with the sin of worry in those moments. All that came to fruition. Like God sort of lit that on fire in that moment. It had all been building over the years. Lil Liliana, years and years of just deep faithfulness and, and the way that you guys got to, to love each other and share scripture and, uh, and grow in, in your faith, that all came to obvious fruition where, where, where it, it just proved that, that this, this really is the way that you get through these things. It really is, the answer really is in God's word. I, any other, in our closing moments here, any other last thoughts about, um, uh, the last question was about um, just anything else that's impressed, uh, that's been impressed upon you through the whole trial. Yeah, I, I got to read this from Tim Challies. Uh, I mean, we may go over a little bit. That's okay, I think. But I'm going to read this from Tim. I read it to my book club guys. But this is really good from, from Tim Challies, who lost his son, Nick. Uh, it's in chapter 40 called It's Time to Rise. Some of you may have read this already, but th this is just great. He says, I awake early, too rested to remain in bed, but too tired to function. I stumble down the stairs, press the start button on the coffee maker, then collapse on the couch as I wait for it to brew. In those few moments, I drift back to sleep and have the most vivid of dreams. In my dream, I see myself lying back in bed with an angelic, when an angelic envoy rouses me with a message. And as surely as Mary knew, as surely as Joseph knew, as surely as Zechariah knew, in my dream, I know. I know the messenger is reliable and his message authentic. God sent me to tell you that Christ will return in exactly one hour. God sent me to tell you that oh yeah, my heart rises, my mind reels, my feet race. Leaping from bed, I run downstairs, grab my coat and keys and sprint out the door. I know exactly where I need to be. One scene fades into the next, and I see myself arriving at Glen Oaks Cemetery, flinging the car door open. I leap into the pre-dawn darkness. Up and down the rows of graves, I begin to, sh to run, shouting out the glad tidings. It's time. It's time, I cry out. It's time to rise. I run up one row and down the next. 
up one row and down the next, my feet pounding over the uneven turf. I watch myself pause briefly by the grave of the young man whose parents have chosen to inscribe it with just three brief words, the words Aslan whispered to Lucy when she was overwhelmed with fear and uncertainty, courage, dear heart. And though those words have so often blessed and strengthened me this morning, I have no need of encouragement. Caleb, I cry out, it's time. It's time to rise. Just a few more minutes and it's time. I take off running once more, but pause almost immediately, this time by a nearby grave where just a few short weeks ago, a family gathered to sing sweet hymns of comfort in both English and Hindi. It's time, my Christian sister, I say in a shout, it's time to rise. I see myself running on, on, on and on, up and down the silent rows, crying out the news. I stop again, this time by a plot where another young man is buried, a young man whose parents once approached Eileen and me to encourage us, to console us, to pray down heaven's comforts upon us. It's time, I shout, it's time. Just a few more moments and you will rise. Your body and soul will be joined together and you'll rise. It's time. The eastern horizon is beginning to glow with the first light of day. The earliest rays of the sun are threatening to break through the clouds hanging low over Lake Ontario. The clock has ticked down to just one minute. And now my feet carry me to the spot in the cemetery that has become most familiar. With my face glowing golden with the sunrise, I pause where I've paused so often. On the edge of that patch of grass that has been tended by my hand and watered by my tears. I drop to my knees in a tone that is confident and unwavering. I say, it's time, my boy. It's time, just one more minute and we'll hear the cry of command. Just one more moment and we'll hear the voice of the archangel. Just a few more seconds and we'll hear the blast of the trumpet. It's time, my boy. It's time, it's time to wake up. It's time to rise. I begin the final countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. And then, and then I become aware again. I become aware that I am on my couch, not in the cemetery. I become aware that it has been a dream, not reality, but I also become aware that my face is wet with tears and my heart rich with joy. For though it has only been a dream, it is a dream that somehow has meditated on the best of all promises, the surest of all hopes. It is a dream that in some shape and some form will most certainly come true. For God has given us his unfailing word. He quotes 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So I would just say in light of the certainty of this event and in the nearness of this event, the certainty of the resurrection, we should make war on sin, redeem time, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. We should never, ever, ever take a day for granted. Parents with your kids, don't take a day for granted. Husbands with your wife, don't take a day for granted. Love them sacrificially and humbly. Cherish your kids, view them as a gift. Hug them, tell them you love them, point them to the word of God. Spend each day well. R.C. Sproul says this, with the certainty of resurrection, steadfastness is called for. Believers should be always abounding in the work of the Lord. The resurrection sparks work in abundance. It is labor that rests in the certainty that no effort made in Christ is futile. Our labor, our pain, our suffering, yea, even our dying are never in vain. Well, we're about to sing together, but Scott, can you pray for us? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, I am thankful, profoundly thankful for this church and for all who came tonight to listen. Uh, and I am thankful for your word. Oh, the preciousness of your, of your word. I pray that we would really would be men and women of the word. We would love and delight in your word. We'd meditate on your word. We'd soak in your word. I'm thankful that your, your word is so precious in, in the face of suffering. It, it begins to radiate with life like it never has before. And Father, I'm thankful for Liliana, her life, uh, her godliness, her faith. I'm thankful that you sustained her to the end. Uh, I am uh, just profoundly grateful for her. And uh, I pray that we would learn from her, be inspired by her godliness, her trust in you in the midst of immense suffering, the fact that she didn't complain. Father, I pray you'd guard us from the sin of complaining and irritability and just give us great contentment like she had And Father, I pray that we would live in light of eternity, live in light of the resurrection, that we really wouldn't take days for granted, that we would be grateful for each day you give us. I pray for the husbands in this room. I do pray that they would love their wives humbly and sacrificially. And I pray that the parents in this room would would love and cherish their their kids. And I pray that all of us would be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our, our labor is not in vain. And we're thankful for the preciousness of the gospel, the righteousness of Jesus that covers us from all our sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you all stand, let's sing together. Don't drop a single anchor 
Through every toil and danger, almost home. How many pilgrim saints have before us gone? No stopping now, we're almost home. That promised land is calling, we're almost home. And not a tear shall fall, then we're almost home. Make ready now your souls for the kingdom come. No turning back, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward the blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. This journey us together, we're almost home. Unto the grave forever, we're almost home. What song anew we'll sing round that happy throne? Pain of heart, we're almost home. Almost home, we're almost home. So press on toward that blessed shore. Oh, praise the Lord, we're almost home. And this life is just a vapor. We're almost home That sun is setting yonder We're almost home Take courage for this darkness Shall break to dawn Oh, lift your eyes We're almost home Almost home We're almost home So press on toward that blessed shore oh praise the lord we're almost home almost home we're almost home so press on toward that blessed shore oh praise the lord we're say 
Father, uh, we thank you for your tremendous grace, even in the midst of the hardships of life. Uh, Lord, thank you for the example that you have given us in Scott and Liliana. Uh, thank you for the way that you worked in them and through them uh, during these last months. And God, I pray that we all would learn from this, that we would not allow this trial to be uh, wasted in any way on ourselves, that we would sink our roots deep into your goodness and sovereignty, and that we would live out of those realities in a way that others would see our good deeds and give glory to our Father in heaven. And Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.